Um, thank you very much for the introduction, Christina, and for the invitation, and also to the to the National Gallery for for hosting us here, and for everybody, uh, to everybody for um, for being here. Um, so, uh, without further ado, this talk looks at um, amputations, dismemberments, and mutations um, of post-Soviet internationalism come imperialism. Um, I'll focus on two landmark architectural sites um, and sculptures contained therein. The Stalinist Palace of Culture and Science in Warsaw, completed in 1955, and Alina Shapochnikov's Monument to Polish-Soviet Friendship, which stood in the building until its dismemberment and discarding in 1992, and the American-designed eco-imperialist Zaryadia Park in Moscow, opened in 2017, and Anna Shevchenko's sculpture Plitka, um, Paving Stone, uh, a dissection of Putinist recolonial infrastructural imperialism, which was created from paving stones destined for Zaryadia. Um, there is no doubt that the story of the coloniality of socialist realism and of so-called socialist internationalism um, or of socialist imperialism needs to be written, theorized, and considered much more extensively. And I think um, Katya's and, and Masha's and other and Zhenya's and other presentations in this panel will situate this historically much more rigorously than I do. Um, Russia's current brutal war of conquest against Ukraine incorporates many mutated tropes, aesthetics, and symbols from the Soviet period, but also direct borrowings from Nazi, manifest borrowings from Nazi and fascist aesthetics. It is schizophrenically framed by Russian war propaganda as a simultaneous project of denazification and of decommunization. How then does an attention to socialist realism shed light on the political aesthetics of Russia's war? Um, what is the role of realism and various types of realism in intensifying or helping us to make sense of the, of the fog of war and of what's actually happening? How might we decolonize socialist realism and the study of Soviet aesthetics and materialities in the face of the imperial violence inherent to the Soviet past and to the post-Soviet um, present? And with, apo so with apologies for the disjointed nature of my presentation, I'll consider several instances, possibly too many, um, of corporeal dismembering and remembering, which relate to some aspects of the questions above. Um, so the monument to Polish-Soviet friendship by Polish sculptor uh, Alina Shapochnikov uh, once stood in the entrance hall uh, to the Palace of Culture and Science, a Stalinist skyscraper gifted, uh, gifted by the USSR to Warsaw in 1955. Shapochnikov's monument, uh, completed in 1955, uh, is a sensuously tinged uh, socialist realist sculpture of a Polish and Soviet worker locked in embrace. Shapochnikov's Soviet friendship, the warmth she felt for Russia, what she perceived to be Russia and the Soviet Union for Polish peasants and workers, was real and was a warm. And so was her socialist realism. Her, her socialist realism was, was genuine, as it were. Uh, despite the fact that her later work, this is her work from the 1960s and 1970s, much better known internationally, determined by her own experience of grave illness, bodily suffering, and disintegration, tuberculosis, bone, and breast cancer, was far removed in terms of style and feeling. Um, but returning to her socialist realist work, Shapochnikov acknowledged uh, the extent to which her geopolitical and ideological position um, and the way that this position impacted her work was influenced by her Jewishness and by her experience of the Holocaust. Shapochnikov's extensive correspondence with her longtime uh, partner, Richard Stanislavski, an aristocrat, and despite or because of his because of his ideological reservations, a grand figure in the Polish communist art world was recently published by the Museum of Modern Art in Warsaw. Um, and amidst these letters, the only surviving, uh, the only strong statement on politics and the sole mention of the Holocaust are delivered in tandem. So these are some um, uh, fragments from this correspondence from the early 1950s. Uh, 
This is a letter from Stanislavski to Alina, for, uh, to Shapochnikov, in which he beseeches her, and Alush, please do not let yourself get carried away by impulses and by the senseless enthusiasm that beats out from your letters as you speak of the new world and social transformation. So he's urging her to keep her emotions in check and to not be too political and to not be too heartfelt. And she responds to him, um, you simply, Richard, you simply look at certain things in such a nice, cultured and polite way. But the difference between her and him uh, lies in the fact that during your formative years, over the last 10 years, you did not go through that baptism of despair. All of that, all of that did not vanish in those times without a trace, as happened for me in the ghettos and camps. And Shaporsnikov was in Auschwitz and in Theresienstadt and in Bergen-Belsen. Um, and then she continues, but your ideas didn't, and so your ideas didn't change as fundamentally as mine, so that instead of nice, cultured, and polite, what was left in, in her was lovely, human, true, and heartfelt. Um, following the fall of the Polish People's Republic in 1989, Shapochnikov's sculpture was sold for the price of scrap metal in 1992 by the palace's administration. Its arms were hacked off in order to fit it through the palace's narrow revolving doors. No one could even be bothered to carry it off to the goods entrance at the, at the rear of the building. The sculpture notoriously stood on a farm outside of Warsaw for decades, uh, several efforts made to retrieve it being unsuccessful. Uh, failed attempts were made to convince by art historians were made to convince various Polish arts institutions to purchase the sculpture in the 1990s and early 2000s. And by the time the institutions wanted it in the late 2000s, the owners realized its value and would not return it. Uh, the empty plinth, incidentally, this whole time left behind by the Friendship Monument continued to stand in the hall until roughly 2015, until the 60th anniversary of the palace. The armless sculpture was eventually put on auction and acquired by an, anonym, an anonymous buyer in 2019 for a seven-figure sum. I think it was two million zlotys, so about 400,000, 500,000 euros. Uh, the buyer subsequently donated it to the Museum of Modern Art in Warsaw to form part of its collection. And the sculpture is currently destined for the lobby of the museum, which is to stand on Parade Square, immediately adjacent to the... Uh, Palace of Culture and Science, which, I mean, I didn't need the pointer to show that, uh, immediately adjacent to the Palace of Culture and Science, which is, which is right there. So this is a, a rendering of the, of the museum building, which is currently under construction. In the lobby of the, new, of the museum building, then, uh, the cycle of expropriation and appropriation mirroring the relationship between the Palace of Culture and the volatile shifting land and property regimes of post-war and socialist Warsaw comes full circle mediated by this act of philanthropy. Um, the sculpture returns almost but not quite home and the museum lobby mimics and taunts the palace lobby whereas the sculpture remains amputated. The future of this idea to install Shapochnikov's uh, monument to Friendship in the museum lobby now is uncertain, or has been uncertain since the um, 24th of February. Is it possible still for, or appropriate for this kind of traumatophilic gesture, in the words of the late Polish art historian Piotr Petrovsky, uh, to be carried out, and in fact to constitute the very core of the institutional ideology of a major new museum? Uh, the, the trauma that this monument represents or em embodies was already powerfully enough felt in Poland in 2012, in tw before 2022. Today, in the light of the slaughter in Ukraine, in a city, Warsaw, which is co-populated by tens of thousands, if not more, Ukrainian migrants, the level of the trauma and of the filia of the friendship uh, or love necessary to overcome or appropriate it is intensified an unquantifiable number of times. The fate of Shapochnikov's statue is mirrored, uh, uh, although in accelerated and distinct form in, in the recent events in Kiev, in the uh, uh, Friendship Arch. Unveiled in 1982, this is an extraordinary example of late modernist abstract monumental public art enveloping a multi-part neo-socialist realist sculptural composition, or still socialist realist sculptural composition that you can see in this photograph. Uh, but the sculptural part, dominated by the monument to Russian-Ukrainian friendship, was removed in April 2022. Commenting on the removal, uh, Vladimir Klitschko, the mayor of uh, the, the, the brother of Kiev's mayor, 
referring to the language of brotherly nations with which many Russians insist on framing their war in Ukraine, wrote, you don't kill your brother, you don't rape your sister. There are many differences between the two uh, friendship monuments, the one in Warsaw and the one in Kiev. In Warsaw, one worker is Polish, the other is an amorphous, nationally non-specific Soviet figure. In Kiev, one worker is Ukrainian, the other worker is Russian. Aliatory, aleatory amputations also occurred during both acts of iconoclasm. In Poland, the arms were removed for practical purposes, whereas in Kiev, the, health, the head fell off uh, by accident. Um, in 2016, uh, Grigory Revzin, one-time dissident architecture critic and since 2012 founding partner and chief ideologist of KB Strelka, a powerful urban consulting bureau carrying out commissions for urban improvement, Blago uh, on behalf of municipalities throughout Russia, wrote a viral Facebook post. The topic of the post was Plitka, uh, the paving stone, which is the chief material artifact uh, of Blagoustroistva. In his post, Revzin castigated those who insisted on ascribing some sort of demonic political power to Plitka. A consensus has formed, Revzin claims, of hatred towards Blagoustroistva. Intelligent city dwellers sensitive to the fate of Russia look at Plitka, and in everyone they do not see granite and a segment of pavement no, they see rubles stolen by a bloody regime, trampled democratic ideals, and the tears of Ukraine. Our Plitka has taken on the characteristics of an innovative psychotechnological material. In every Plitka there is Putin, and he draws life power out through the legs of feeling and thinking pedestrians. Sabianin, the mayor of Moscow, lays down the Plitka in order to make us weaker with every step. Revzin's sarcastic, um, sarcastic refu protestations were the subject of a direct refutation in artist and architect Anna Shevchenko's installation, Putin in Every Plitka, executed for an uh, exhibition held at Moscow's Museum of Architecture in 2018. Shevchenko stenciled images based on disembodied details of several iconic bodily comportments adopted by Putin. Crucifix emblazoned muscular torso, muscular arm fishing out classical amphorae spontane uh, spontaneously discovered off the coast of Crimea, and the trickster wink onto original um, uh, stolen hexagonal plitki from Zaryadia Park. Laid on the floor of the museum, several hundred meters from the Kremlin wall, Shevchenko's plitki ex elicited a mixture of terror and delight from exhibition audiences. Revzin's protestations are disingenuous, Shevchenko's work suggests. A singular and indivisible Putin may not literally inhabit every one of Mos Moscow's Plitsky, but they are necessarily marked by an identifiable, if dismembered and mediated, sovereign presence. Audience members were happy to dismember, trample over, ridicule, express their disrespect for Putin. No one was particularly reluctant to, to, to express their kind of, uh, to express their disregard for, for, for this dismembered sovereign. However, they were much less keen to embrace artworks that went deeper in their interrogation of the imperial component of Russian identity. Um, one artwork by Alexander Morozov, for example, highlighted Zaryadi's role in Russia's historic colonization process as the site of the 16th century headquarters of the English Muscovy Company, which was instrumental in the, con in the conquest of Siberia, driven in part by the demand for sable fur. Reactions to invocations of colonialism in um, Morozov's work and in numerous other contexts were delivered by audiences to the show in a mocking register in which the artist's grasp on reality was frequently cast into doubt. In the words of one exhibition visitor, a physicist in her mid-40s, this is digging very deeply. There may have been an element of gentlemen of fortune in Russian history, gentlemen of Udachi, but the idea that there was colonization, no, this absolutely did not happen. And this was a typical kind of refrain, that there, this, is, this is bullshit, that there was no colonialism in, in Russian history. Another visitor, um, a carpenter from Bashkorkostan, expressed um, a different sort of indignation. Following the guide's description of one of the works which emphasized the colonization of small nations in the Urals in Siberia, this is a, the, the, the wording of the museum guide, 
the visitor cast doubt on the implied description of his nationhood in terms of colonial subjecthood. Quote, here I disagree with you. I am from the Urals myself. I do not feel as if we were colonized. The last person who tried to do this was Mamai. And this is a reference not to the Cossack Mamai, but, <laughs> but to the Mongol Han, whose defeat by Muscovy in Kulikovo marked the beginning of the decline of the, of the Golden Horde and the, and, the, and the rise of Muscovy. One of the, one of the most bizarre and most disturbing among um, Putin's increasingly unhinged uh, war speeches came on 3rd of March, 2022 awarding a posthumous Hero of Russia award to a soldier from Dagestan who died in Ukraine, Putin put himself forward as a sovereign personification of the centripetal imperial diversity of Russia and as a personalized microcosm, a one-man embodiment of Russia's colonial war. Um, I am an ethnically Russian person. My family history goes full circle from Ivan to Maria. But when I see examples of such heroism as the accomplishments of the young Nur Magomed, Gadri Magomedov, a Dagestan-born ethnic lak, I want to say, I am a lak, I am a Dagestani, I am Chechen, I am English, I am Russian, Tatar, Jew, Mordvin, Ossetian. Russian public culture, public space and architecture revels in these kinds of centripetal condensations of imperial diversity. They crop up endlessly in my research on architecture and politics in post-Soviet Russia. In Zaryadye Park, Russia's multifarious vegetal and geological diversity is showcased in four discrete subsections, each one representing or rather characterizing this country's so-called landscape zones, tundra, taiga, steppe, and forest lowlands. Whereas in the park's Tatlin Tower-esque florarium, a spiral staircase is bedecked with stainless steel planters from which sprout vegetal and floral metonyms for each one of the country's 82 administrative divisions. The apex of the spiral and the vertical culmination of the florarium's eco-imperial narrative are the planters containing booty flora, silk trees, prunes, rosemary, grapes, and lavender, hailing from the two administrative territories of Ukraine temporarily occupied in 2014 by Russia's armed forces, the Autonomous Republic of Crimea and the city of Sevastopol. Other gestures of centripetal, centripetal gathering proliferate in Zaryadye. The cuisines of all Russia and the post-Soviet space beyond are gathered in the, in the restaurant, whereas the labor force of all of Russia and the post-Soviet space beyond Oh, this is, yeah, the, these are just some images of the diversity gathered in the cosmically themed restaurant. Yeah. Um, that's enough. Uh, and the, the labor force of all Russia and the post-Soviet space beyond is gathered in the workers' gorodok, the slum-like encampment concealed from street-level view by luscious renderings of the completed park in which the workers of Zaryadia, most of them migrants from Central Asia, oops, oh no, I have to go through the whole presentation now. Most of them workers from Central Asia and from the Russian provinces eat, sleep, rest, and gather. So coming towards my uh, conclusion, um, Putin, in other words, the collective embodiment of, the, of this kind of dismembering, confused, um, belligerent post-Soviet Russian state is not necessarily the problem. People are thrilled to step on Putin, to enjoy his pain and to dismember his body. In order to get at the real source of the problem, to, to hijack the opportune phrasing of the museum visitor cited, it's necessary to dig deeper, to adopt a kind of critical ethnographic realism which shows collective life as it is, not so much in its revolutionary development as in its reactionary disintegration. So instead of a conclusion, I, I'm ending just by showing this image of one more disturbingly prescient artwork made for, but not shown at, the 2018 exhibition at the Moscow Museum of Architecture, Method, Message of the Day by Tatiana Baskovskaya and Hans Gnida. Both names are pseudonyms. This work, a digitally reprinted watercolor painting, mocks the neo-socialist realist computer, re computer renderings of Zaryadia produced by its American architects and the publicity photographs of grinfully fro frolicking heteronormative white families circulated by the Moscow mayoralty's PR team. 
in, in Baskovskaya and Gnida's vision, the skylights of the Zaryadia Media Center pavilion, whose undulating roof co-constitutes the park's surface, morph into missile silos. The phallic rockets which protrude from them are marked with familiar propaganda slogans, Zamir for peace and Zadruzhbu for friendship. These slogans redolent not only of the name, are redolent not only of the name Zaryadia Park, but also of official Soviet era militarized pacifism and Russocentric internationalism, which have also been repeatedly invoked by Russia's propaganda war machine since the invasion. Uh, in, and in spoken as well as written form, their resonance is disturbingly amplified by their foregrounding of the letter Z. Um, that's the end. Thank you.